We ready to get in the Word? Come on, why don't we stand to our feet? If you can open up your Bibles to the book of Romans, Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. If you don't have your Bible, it's all good. Thank God for technology. We got it on the screens for those of you who may not have one. Romans chapter 12, verse number two. This is what the Bible reads. It says, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you. Somebody say transform. transform. But let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for this evening. Lord, thank you for every heart that is here today. Father, I thank you that you have an in-season, on-time word for every person. Father, I thank you that this evening's word, Father, will quench the thirst of your people. Father God, that tonight's word would give your people direction, Father God, that it would encourage them to want to renew their minds so that they can experience the transformation, Lord, that you have for their life, for their family, for their children, for their marriage, and before their businesses. In Jesus' name, everybody that believed is said, amen. amen, amen. You may have a seat in the presence of the Lord. So um, for those of you, again, who may not know, I'd like to share with you a little bit of, of my history, right? Because I think a lot of us got some history, right? Some of us uh, may not be very proud of our history, but I believe we all got some history. We got some stuff that we probably shoved up under the rug that we would not tell everybody about because we just don't want people to judge us. You know, there's some things that you just can't tell people because, like, you know that they're going to judge you even though they're a Christian. While you're telling them, they give you that look, like the look of judgment, like, you know what I mean? That's the judgment look. Yeah, so myself, though, I, I, I have history, yes, and what's so awesome is that when I decided to follow Jesus, a lot of that history shifted, and now actually, it's no longer history, but it's actually Jesus' story, so now my life has become more of his story, and that's what I've begun to live out, but I didn't wake up a pastor, Okay, matter of fact, uh, a lot of my history, I had a lot of challenges. I had a lot of difficulties growing up. There's so many things. There's, there's a past mentality that I had that led me to a lot of pain in my life. And if you could just kind of go with me, um, a lot of times it's, it, what I went through affected how I thought. And I don't know if you've been there before. There's a lot of things that we experience in life as we grow up and it affects the way that we think. It's almost like these certain events that have this huge impact on our lives, and all of a sudden that event has shifted the way we think. And for myself, one of the most difficult things that I had to process or that I had to, had to cope with or deal with growing up, and that was the loss of my father. My father made a decision uh, in his life that led him to prison, and uh, to this day, uh, this was 25 years ago that he made this decision but he'll be getting out in less than a year. Yeah. Praise God. But not having a father as a young man really affected my mentality. It really hurt me because I, I, I didn't understand. As a matter of fact, one of the greatest uh, burdens that I had mentally was a why. Sometimes that's the biggest burden that we can, we can walk with when we go through something is this why. And I'm pretty sure a lot of us have been there because there's some things that you've gone through that you didn't ask for. And that led you to this conclusion and it was this big question mark called why. And because you didn't have an answer, you ran to answers in the world. And that's what I did because that was the mentality that I took on. I took on this mentality that didn't understand, so I went and searched for answers in all the wrong places. I went and looked for answers at parties. Hello, I was the party man. Come on, the party wouldn't start till I showed up. And that's because of what I showed up with that would start the party going. Don't ask me what it was, okay? Again, I'm talking about history. This isn't a week ago, this is pre-salvation. Come on, some of you got the judgment face going. I just wanna clarify. <laughs> So we're like, whoa, wait a minute, wait a minute. No, no, no. This is, this is a pre-salvation prior to what God did in my life, prior to meeting God. Yeah, before Christ, B.C. 
there's a lot of things that I started to do that started to contribute to my mentality. And eventually I reached a point in my life where I didn't like where I was. Matter of fact, it's not even that I didn't like where I was. I actually really didn't like who I was. But I realized that a lot of who I became went back to how I thought. A lot of who I was really went back and it stemmed back to how I thought and how I processed things and the burdens that went on in my mind and everything that I went through and the questions that I had. And without having a father, I just figure I'm just going to lead myself. That's an unhealthy mentality. The mentality that says, well, fine, if there's no man to lead me here, then I'll be that man that leads me, which is kind of challenging because how could you lead yourself when you don't know your future? And yet we walk around like we know what the future looks like. And so I thought I knew where I was going, but in reality, I had no idea what my future looked like. So the mentality of I'm going to lead myself was very unhealthy. But again, I reached a point in my life where I didn't like not just who I was, but I didn't like where I was. And I started to desire something better. And I think a lot of us that have some history and have been through certain challenges in life, I think a lot of us have been in that position where we wanted better. We know that, we knew, we came to this point just where like, okay, I really, I don't like where I'm at. But God, what do I do? Or maybe there wasn't even a God to reach out to. And matter of fact, that was another difficult thing that I went through. My mentality, the way I perceived God was very unhealthy. Because my mentality about the father was, wait a minute, you're telling me that there is this spiritual father that loves me. I can't understand that because there wasn't even a real father to love me. So I had this unhealthy mentality that was leading me astray, that was taking me to certain destinations that I really didn't like, that I know in the end, when I woke up the next day, come on, there's this thing called a hangover and all this other stuff. I, I, really, I really knew I didn't want to be where I was at. But it's what I kept running to. And I, I think this, we reach a point to where we start to desire a better destiny whether it's a better destiny for yourself, whether it's a better destiny for your marriage, whether it's a better destiny for your business, come on, whether it's a better destiny just for your life in general. Is there anybody in here that, would, that wants just a better destination? Something better to look forward to, right? Yeah, that's a lot of us here. But what I realized in that moment was that the destiny that I desired didn't match the mentality that I had. In other words, my current mental condition, my mentality at that time didn't match the destiny that I desired. There's something that had to take place between then and where I'm at now. And it was a renewing of my mind. I desired that transformation that we read about in Romans chapter 2. But I, again, I desired that destiny, but it didn't match my current mentality at that time. So I had to renew my mind because what I found out is how I think, the way I think a lot of times determines who I am and what I do. And I'm not saying that just because it sounds good. Matter of fact, we can find it in Proverbs 23 verse number seven. Look at this is Bible. Okay. Somebody say this Bible. This is Bible. It's not just me. It's not Andrew. Look at what the Bible says. It says, for as he thinks in his heart, so is he. As he thinks in his heart, so is he. So it's almost like your, your, your thinking really dictates your being. Does that make sense? Your thinking determines your being, how you process things. And that's why I was so stuck in the past because of my thinking at that time. My past mentality doesn't match my present reality. Today, I'm a small group's pastor. Five years ago, I was not. I was drifting. Why? Because my mentality was unhealthy. And between my past and my present, one very key thing that took place in my life was renewing of my mind. 
the renewing of my mind because I had some very messed up thoughts. Now, every now and then, I still have a messed up thought. I think, come on, if we're all honest, every now and then you got a messed up thought. Come on. That, that person that cuts you, over, uh, cuts you off, Hello. messed up thought comes through, right? Uh-huh. Sometimes that messed up thought leads to a messed up action. And then you find yourself, you go home and you repent, Lord, I'm sorry for giving them the holy finger, my bad. You know, <laughs> Father, forgive me. But, again, the reason I say that, though, is because currently I still have some thoughts that cross my mind. But because my mind is renewed, no longer does it stay there. Because my renewed mind doesn't accept old thinking. If you have a renewed mind, you won't stay in old thinking. And so I'll have these thoughts. You'll, you'll, you'll have these thoughts. They'll take place, but it doesn't stay. It won't stay rooted. Come on, it won't start to direct your life. Why? Because I have a renewed mind. And that renewed mind doesn't allow me to go back to old habits. That renewed mind doesn't allow me to go back to old ways, right? The thought is there, right? The thought is there. But I have renewed my mind. It doesn't allow it to take root. But we will have these thoughts. And sometimes our thinking has a lot to do with our responding, how we respond. How we think, how we respond. Why? Because remember, thinking determines our being. We read that in Proverbs, right? Right? Which then determines our responding. So thinking, being leads to responding. Does that make sense? Okay? You're thinking, you're being, who you are, responding. Okay? And I want to point something out. And when I thought about this, I thought about the responses of the disciples in a, in a very famous passage. Uh, if you haven't read about it, you can go to it. It's in Matthew 14. I believe it starts with around verse number 22. Okay, this is where the disciples find themselves in the middle of a storm. Okay, they find themselves in the middle of a storm in the Sea of Galilee. All right. And what's amazing is Jesus, prior to them actually crossing over the Sea of Galilee, he just tells them, hey, um, we're going to go to the other side. I'll meet you guys there and uh, go ahead, launch out. Let's go. And in the middle of crossing over, they find themselves in the middle of a storm. But what's amazing is in the middle of that storm, there's two different responses, okay? There's the response of the disciples who stayed in the boat, and then there's a response of this one crazy disciple who decides to step out of a boat in the middle of the storm. And you're probably asking yourself, well, how does that do with thinking? Well, there's two different responses. Remember, thinking, being, responding. So when I thought about this story, I thought, what was Peter's thinking? And what were the disciples thinking? Because one stayed stuck in the boat, or a few of them, I should say, stayed stuck in the boat. But Peter stepped out of the boat. There was two types of thinking in this moment. And I think a lot of us, we can relate because we'll experience storms, right? We all have experienced challenges, right? We all go through storms. It's amazing because Jesus, this is Jesus telling the other disciples, you would have think, I mean, this is Jesus, the son of God. You would have think he would have forewarned them. Hey, fellas, check this out. Go on the other side. But hey, about halfway, you're going to go through a storm. They probably would have been like, nah, we're good, Jesus. Hey, let's wait till the storm passes on by. But there's a reason. See, God, just because there's the presence of a storm does not mean the absence of God, okay? A lot of times we want to blame God, like it's his fault. You know, why is this going on? God, why am I in this storm? And all of a sudden that stinking thinking starts to come into play and we have that why. We result back to the same why that we used to, we used to think about in our past. Why is this happening, God? This storm. Oh, my God, my bills. I'm living check to check. Why, God? My husband, he cray. Why, God? And we... <laughs> but all we're doing is res resulting back. But it's amazing because in that story, there was one man by the name of Peter who responded. Something in his mentality was renewed and could accept the call of Jesus who ended up walking out on the middle of the storm 
Because a lot of times God is right there in the middle of your storm. He just wants to see how you respond to it. Why? Why? Because you're responding shows God your being, which also shows God your thinking, which lets, know, lets God know if you're ready for what's next for your life. And Peter steps out of the boat. I could imagine the faith mentality that he had. I could imagine what he was thinking in the moment when Jesus just simply said, come, because Peter responded with a question. He said, Jesus, if that's really you, you know, all right, call me out. He, he probably said it like as if Jesus wasn't going to call him out. Jesus, if that's you, you can call me out in the middle of the storm. And Jesus says, come, and he probably went, well, okay. Uh, but there was something within him, a faith mentality, this renewed mentality that said, step out in the middle of a storm, in the middle of a storm. But then look at the response of the rest of the disciples. I wonder what their mentality was like. I wonder what probably needed to be still renewed within them because they stayed stuck on the boat in the middle of a storm. And I think we can relate. You ever been stuck in the middle of a storm when God's actually calling you to step out, but yet you stay stuck in the boat? And again, I think because of our, our thinking, which determines our being, which leads to our responding, our response is, I'll just stay in the boat. And we miss out on the very thing that God has for us in the middle of a storm. Because Peter walked on water. His response. Imagine his bragging rights when he got back in the boat. Yeah, he, he might have he sunk a little bit. The Bible doesn't say that he drowned. He might have sunk a little bit. But I can imagine him getting all wet back in the boat. And the disciples are like, dang. Did y'all see Peter? <laughs> Homie took like five steps on water. You ever see that before? <laughs> see, it was two different mentalities. Two different types of thinking. There was a faith mentality of Peter, but then there was a fear mentality of the rest of the disciples because fear will cause you to stay stuck in the boat. That's what fear does. See, God will purposefully allow us to experience a storm in life, but we find ourselves stuck in fear. God's like, no, step out in the storm. Watch me do something miraculous. I know it may not look like how you want it to look like, but watch yourself walk on water. I want to show you something that you didn't know you had in you, an ability to walk on water. Hello. Hello. Peter would have never known that he could walk on water. But there was something renewed in his mind. Jesus called him out. And he steps out. But then there's that fear that keeps us so stuck. That emotion, the fear emotion. Has anybody dealt with that fear before? That has just kept you stuck in life? Maybe because you feel disqualified, you disqualify yourselves. I believe that a lot of times we disqualify ourselves from the miracle because of our mentality. See, Peter experienced the miracle because of his faith mentality. The disciples disqualified themselves from the miracle because of their fear mentality. And I think a lot of times fear keeps us from experiencing that miracle that God wants us to experience in the midst of of a storm and that emotional state called fear just really keeps us so stuck. Emotions are powerful. Emotions are very, now, now keep in mind, God made us with emotions. Why? Because other than that, we'd be walking zombies. Okay. Imagine somebody motionless. They'd be like all numb. How you doing? Yeah, I'm good. Yeah. No joy, no, no nothing, no fear, no nothing, just emotionless. But we have emotions. It's something that God gave us. But sometimes there's these unhealthy emotions that mislead us. Okay? Think of the word emotion. I would break down the word emotion as an empowering motion. Okay? An empowering motion. 
The problem or our challenge is, is that we give too much power to the wrong emotion. We give too much authority to fear. The reason the disciples didn't step out of the boat is because they authorized fear to keep them stuck. They let fear, they gave fear the power to keep them stuck. They were scared of their condition, of what was going on around them. But yet Peter's faith inside of him, again, caused him to step out. We give too much power to the wrong emotions. We give too much power to fear. We give too much power to frustration. We give too much power to bitterness. We give too much power to, to, to unforgiveness. We give too much power to depression. And it becomes our way of thinking. And the only reason it becomes our way of thinking is because we've empowered it. We've empowered depression. We've empowered fear. We've empowered all of these, the unforgiveness. It's an empowering motion, something that moves you. These are some of the, these are some of the uh, emotions that our mind really battles. These are some of the brain battles that I think a lot of us have experienced. The first one I've already talked about, that's anxiety and fear. And it's amazing because anxiety and fear is ignited by a predetermined future. But when you consider faith, faith is actually a predestined future. So fear and anxiety is a predetermined, your mentality, a predetermined future. In other words, you've already considered what's ahead. You've be, you came up with what's going to happen. You came up with it, not God. A predestined future, faith, is something that God came up with which is given by his word, okay? Does that make sense? And it's amazing how we do that. We predetermine the future. And God's like, that doesn't match up with what I predestined for you. But you're so stuck in what you predetermined of how it's going to be and what it's going to look like and how it's going to turn out. There's also depression. And depression is ignited by past regrets, the whole what if, a soulless job. And basically what that means, if you're, if you're understanding, what, well, what would a soulless job be? A soulless job would be something that's not your purpose, where you feel like you're not making a difference. Because God has called each and every one of us to make a difference. God has a purpose for you and I. He can make your career, your calling, a purpose. There's also the wreck of a relationship. Hello, I've experienced that. And I had some depressing times too in my past. I think some of us have been there as well. And the reason I wanna, the reason I wanna expose these is so that you can renew your mind from where you're at to where God wants you to be. Because that's what I had to do. Because that transformation starts by our thinking. Again, we read it in Romans 12, verse number two. There's also the rebellious mentality. I've had some of that too. I've dealt with every one of these. I was so jacked up. Just saying, if God can use me, he can use each and every one of you in this place. Believe me. But it starts with a renewed mind. The rebellious mentality is lack of direction or unhealthy direction. Unhealthy direction would be negative influence. Sometimes you got to check your circle. You got to really analyze who you roll with. Because who you roll with can have you rolling out. Just saying. Again, I've been there. Guilty. I'm guilty of all this here. That's why I'm able to talk about it. I love it. Because that's the past. You know, you're excited when it's the past. You get depressed when it's the current, but... The rebellious mentality. And so what I want to leave you with today is what I want to encourage you with. Because maybe you're asking yourself now, okay, I, I understand, Andrew, that in order to get to where God wants me to be, that step, the multiplication, that increase, that changed life, to get to kind of maybe where you're at, not exactly, but to see that life transformation is, is, is a renewed mind. But maybe you're asking yourself, 
but where do I start? What is that like? Because I, I don't want to just give you inspiration without direction. Inspiration without direction just leaves you on a spiritual high. But then you keep coming back for a high because you have no direction. So the first thing, the first thing that you want to do in order to start renewing your mind, the very first thing you need to find is motivation. Motivation. And you may be asking, what kind? You need to find a burden. You need to find a burden. Let me show you. Let me, let me, let me break this down uh, with the book of Nehemiah. In Nehemiah chapter 2, okay? Look at what it says. In the book of Nehemiah chapter 2, starting with verse number 2, it says, So the king asked me, the me in there is, is Nehemiah. Okay, the king asked Nehemiah, why are you looking so sad? You don't look sick to me. You must be deeply troubled. Deeply troubled. Then I was terrified, but I replied, long live the king. How can I not be sad? For the city where my ancestors are buried is in ruins and the gates have been destroyed by fire. This is Nehemiah who has this burden. The Bible says that you just read, it said he was deeply troubled, deeply troubled. Why? Because he found out that his homeland, Jerusalem, the walls had been broken down. That's the burden that he had. But I wanna show you how his burden turned into the motivation. Okay, because I think a lot of us need some motivation. We need that encouragement. The motivation is what gets us moving, right? For some of you, it's coffee, okay? I get it. But coffee won't renew your mind, okay? <laughs> We're learning how to renew our mind here. <laughs> May get you happy for a little bit, but that'll wear off. But I want to show you something. After Nehemiah got this news about the homeland, Jerusalem, and the walls being broken down, and how it troubled him, he had the burden but look at, what, look at what the motivation was. Look at what it was. In Nehemiah chapter four, verse number six, look at what they did. It says, so we built the wall and the entire wall was joined together up to half its height where the people had a mind to work. The people had a mind to work. It started out with a burden, right? In other words, he wasn't content with his condition of his people. A lot of us don't have any motivation because we're content with our condition. In other words, when you look around you, there's nothing that you may want to change. If there's no motivation to change, you won't move to change. In other words, if there's no motivation to renew that mind, you're not going to want to renew that mind. See, contentment will kill the desire to change. Contentment will kill that desire to change. And I think I've, I was there before. I, I just had accepted things were so bad in my life that I just accepted it. I said, well, this is the way it is. Kind of throwing in the towel kind of thing. And I was just content. And I was like, well, I'll just embrace it. I'll just accept it. I'll just deal with it. Has anybody had a deal with it mentality? Because you don't see what you desire to change. And you're like, well, I'm just going to deal with it. And all of a sudden, the deal with it mentality just keeps you so stuck again, just like the disciples on the boat, and there's no motivation. There has to be a burden. When you look at, for those who want their marriage to get better, it's only going to get better if there's a burden, because if there's no burden, there's going to be no motivation for it to be better. Where you're at in life now, if where you're at in life now doesn't lead you to want something better, then there's no burden. If there's no burden, there's no motivation. That's why, that's the motivation we need. We need that burden. We have to look around and say, hey, does, do I want to get better? Can something get better in my life? Can I get better in my business? Hey, as a husband or a wife, can I get better in my marriage? If you're going to school, can I get better in school? Come on, if you're working, uh, if you're an owner, can I get better as an owner? I think there's uh, plenty of areas that we can get better which means we should all walk out with a burden. The, that should motivate us to change. Because if not, then you may want to ask yourself, am I content? Is this as, as, is this as good as it's going to get? Have I reached satisfaction? 
because satisfaction will also keep you stuck. The satisfaction of today will actually stop you from succeeding tomorrow. Are we satisfied? I believe God is greater. I believe God can take you to a place, a destiny that you may not even fathom yet. I believe God can do mighty things in every area of your life, of your family, in your children, in your marriage, in your business, whatever it is that you're doing, I believe God can do greater if you allow him to renew your mind. We can all get better. Each and every one of us can get better in here. Me, myself, I'm not even content with where I'm at right now. Why? Because I know my God is greater. And I know that I could even get better at where I'm at. I can get better as a pastor. Maybe I can get better in my compassion. You know, even as a pastor, just to let you know, we all have, Pastor Obed teaches us to have what we call a heart check, which is pretty much a self-inspection. Why? Because you can't expect what you don't inspect. In other words, if you don't inspect yourself, you don't know where you can get better. And so even us as pastors and staff, we too are always looking to get better better in our compassion, better at leading a campus, better at leading a team, better at relational leadership, better in different areas. So even for us, this doesn't, I don't want you to think that this uh, gives us, we're exempt from getting better. No, we're even looking to get better. But we want you to get better too. We want to see you succeed. We want to see you and having that renewed mind and watching God just do amazing things in your life. We have to have that burden to get better. The second thing that can help us renew our mind is instruction. Instruction. What kind of instruction? God's word. God's word is the best instruction for the destination for your life. For any destiny, for any destination that you so desire, God's instruction will get you there. Without instruction, we end up wandering because there's nothing to direct us. Look at what it says in Joshua 1.7. I love it. Joshua 1.7 says this. It says, be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey part of God's instruction. No, 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 no. That's not what it says, right? No, the Bible says, be careful to obey all the instruction Moses gave you. Do not deviate from them. In other words, don't shift from the instruction that God is trying to give us. Do not deviate from them, turning either to the right or to the left. Then you will be successful in everything you do. So wait a minute. That's that's a phenomenal outcome. So that's just basically telling me if I follow God's instruction, I'll find success. That's exactly what it's saying. It it sounds kind of simple, right? But right now, maybe your mentality can't really digest it yet because there may be some renewing that needs to take place. Why? Because this may be something new. And sometimes it's hard to digest something new when you still got an old mentality, right? Because it sounds simple. Oh, follow God's instructions. I'll find success. Awesome. I'm going to start tomorrow. (laughs) Sounds pretty simple, right? But it is challenging. I have to level with you. There is, it is challenging. But what's awesome is that no matter what, God is with us every step of the way. Because the Bible says that he doesn't leave us nor forsake us. Instruction. The third one. The third thing that's going to help us renew our mind is meditation. Meditation. And this is where prayer comes into place, okay? Prayer will help us renew our mind. Look at what it says in Psalms 1, 2 through 3. It says this, but they delight in the law of the Lord, okay? That that word law means instruction. So I'm just going to read it that way. But they delight in the instruction of the Lord meditating on it day and night. When I first read that, I was like, dang, they meditate on it day and night? I'm missing something. And maybe, Lord, that's why I still got some stinking thinking because I ain't meditating on it day and night. I had to be honest with myself. Come on, sometimes you got to just get honest with yourself. You can't lie to self. It's kind of weird. But I think sometimes we still do that. We try to convince ourselves otherwise. Meditating on it day and night. It goes on, verse number three says, they are like trees planted along the river bank. In other words, you'll always be next to a source. 
bearing fruit each season. In other words, you'll always have provision. I love it. Goes on, it says, their leaves never wither. They never wither. In other words, you'll never grow dry. It goes on, it says, and they prosper in all they do. Dang. So I'm reading, this is like two verses that I already went through. One said that I'll find success. We just read in Joshua, right? That if we listen to God's instruction, find success. Now this one is telling me that I will prosper. Do we, you think God's trying to tell you something about how valuable it is to renew our minds? And how meditating on the word day and night has a lot to do with that? Meditation is like a filter. What it does is it allows you to actually hit pause and filter out the things that are not of God. But see, a lot of us don't pause in life. I think because sometimes the demand of every day sometimes keeps us going, so we never really give God that opportunity during prayer to pause, to meditate on his word, so that we can walk out of our home in the morning with a renewed mind. Come on, I think we've all been there. We're just going and going and going. Get up, get ready, get the kids ready. Come on, baby screaming. My son, man, my son, sometimes he's screaming. He's flushing around. I got to put on a show that distracts him for a little bit so I can get ready. And sometimes I'm just, I'm just always just getting ready. I got to do this, got to do this to get out of the house. And next, you know, I'm out of the house and I'm driving to the church. And I'm like, "Uh uh-oh, I didn't pray. I'm, I'm being honest with you. I would just be so rushed in the day, in the morning at times. And I'm on my way in my truck and I'm like, oh man, I would just so caught up in the demand of the morning and I didn't take that time to meditate, to just pray to, so that I could start my day with a renewed mentality. That's why prayer early on in the morning is so healthy. And I'm not here to tell you how long to pray, whether it's this long or that long, right or wrong. Honestly, prayer will be just a dialogue with the Father. You can speak to him, but then you also stay silent to allow him to speak to you. But meditation is like this filter. It allows you, it allows you, it allows God to filter out the things that are not gonna help you prosper throughout the day. Meditation, I wanna show you something. I love it because scientists, everything that they dig into, all they keep doing is backing up what God already said. I love it. And I don't know if you're that type of person where you're like, well, what does science say about it? You know, you need like those hard facts and that's all good. You know, there's some people that need those hard facts. It's all good. So I want to show you something. It's amazing what scientists have even said about meditation. Okay. Look at this. It says scientists agree. Okay. Scientists agree. Meditation is the number one brain changer. Backed by thousands of studies, neuroscientists now view meditation as the top way to upgrade your brain with the potential to transform your life in many big ways. Wait a minute. I've seen this statement before. This looks familiar. Let's go back real quick to the beginning of Romans, Romans chapter two. Come on, Romans chapter 12, verse number two. Romans chapter 12, verse number two. Okay, if we could just put that up, it's the, it was the first slide. Romans chapter 12, verse number two. Look at this. Don't copy the behavior and custom of this world, but let God transform you into the new person by what? Changing the way you think. My God, see scientists just keep backing up what God already said. But that's how important meditation is, that time to relax, that that time to pause. So you can, again, allow the things to filter out that are not of God so that you can start your day with a renewed mentality so you don't go back to that old thinking. And lastly, as I close, the fourth thing that I would encourage you to do that's going to help renew your mind, and that is action. Action, which means take a step. Take a step, just a step. Nobody's, nobody's asking you to print a uh, sprint tonight. I'm not here to put more pressure on you. Just one step. Why? Because small steps lead to great destinies. Small steps lead to big impacts. Where I'm at today, like I said in the beginning, It wasn't because I started sprinting. No, it's because I took one step at a time. 
I could eat. There was even times where I took little steps. There was even times where my steps were like this. Right? Because I was a little unsure, you know. And I, okay, God, I took another step of faith. Right? But again, even that step, I wasn't at where I used to be. It was a step. It was small, but it was a step. Then another step. And all of a sudden, my faith in the Father, because the Bible says that faith comes by hearing the word of God. And I kept hearing the word. I kept meditating on it. I kept allowing the word to motivate me, to move me. So little baby steps led to regular steps. Why? Because my faith started increasing. Then I said, Lord, if you're doing this, if you did this in just one year, Father, I thank you. I'm going to take another step, Lord. Hey, hallelujah. You know what? I'm in a storm right now, God. But you know what? Like Peter, I'm going to go ahead and step out anyway. Hey, I'm going to step out of the boat take a step take a step just got to start somewhere I would encourage you with that start somewhere we all have a start sometimes there's a struggle in the startup but because starting is so important just start With every head bowed and every eye closed, if you're here tonight and you're saying, man, Andrew, you're right. Man, I've been stuck. I'm kind of like the disciples you were talking about, just stuck. I've just been in fear. I've been overwhelmed by depression. You know what, Andrew? I've just been moved by anxiety because of my situation. Andrew, I feel like I'm even in a storm and I don't see Jesus. Well, I want to encourage you. Jesus is here. God set his son for both you and I so that we didn't have to be chained to our past. It's love that breaks every chain, the chain of regret, the chain of depression, the chain of that rebelliousness. If you've never made the decision to follow Jesus, if you're here and you've never made that decision, You can take a step by deciding to follow Jesus, by receiving him as your Lord and your Savior. If that's you this evening, because remember, it starts with a step. If that's you this evening and you want to take that step of faith and say, I want to receive all that God has for me. And it first starts by receiving his love, his son, Jesus, who he sent for you and I to die on the cross so that you and I would no longer have to be bound by our sin. If that's you. I just want you to take a stand. I just, I just ask, just take a stand where you're at. That's all. Nobody's here to judge you. Just take a stand. Say, I, I, don't worry about the person next to you. Just, just take a stand. Just take a stand. If that's you, just take a stand. If that's you. Don't, don't, be, don't worry about it. We just want to love on you. Come on, just take a stand. Anybody else? I'm just going to give a few more seconds. We got a few people that have already stood up and made that decision. Come on, anybody else? I want to take a stand. Amen. Amen. So good. So good. God bless you, bro. God bless you right here in the front. God bless you, young man. Young man, God has an amazing thing for your life. God loves you so much, dude. I know you, I know you may not really know about all of God's love, but I just want to tell you, man, I just, I'm sorry. I just got to be obedient and tell you. That's what, that's what God's telling me right now, that he loves you, man. He loves you so much, and he's been waiting for you to take a stand just like you did this evening. This service was for you and for everybody else that's here this evening. Look at all these people that are standing. Come on. Let's give it up for them. So good. Amen. Amen. Hey, if you could remain standing, just remain standing in this moment because we want to pray with you. The Bible says out of Romans 10, the Bible says in Romans 10, says that if you confess with your mouth that the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You experience salvation by those two things. So right now, we want to pray with you. We want to confess with you. And we also want to believe with you. So if you could just repeat after me in church, hey, let's be, we're a family here. So if we could pray with them, just by repeating after me, let's, let's bow our heads and let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for your love that's always been there. Even in the times where I didn't see it or I didn't even want it. But Father, 
I embrace that love. I receive your Lord. I receive Jesus. I believe he died on the cross for my sins so that I can be forgiven. But he resurrected for my purpose. This day and moving forward will never be the same. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for leading me every step of the way. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Come on, let's give it up for them one more time. Amen. So good. So good. Come on. You guys received that word this evening? Yeah, let's all stand. So good. Hey, for those of you um, that made that life-transforming decision, first of all, our lead pastors, Obed and Lisette Martinez, they'd be so proud of you. Our staff and pastors, we're so proud of you. And matter of fact, we can't wait to connect with you. We can't wait to help you on your journey. So you were handed a card. If you were serious about that decision that you made, if you were serious about that decision, take just one minute, fill out that card, and all you're going to do is you're going to hand it out, hand it in a bucket on your way out. We just want you to drop that. Why? Because we want to connect with you, and we don't want you to continue this journey alone because it gets that much more difficult when you do it alone. Amen? Amen, amen. Come on, let's give it up for God and all that he did this evening. So good. Woo! Come on. We're all pumped to renew our minds, right? Come on. Amen. Come on, if you stretch your hands for the blessing. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much, Father, for your people. Lord, I thank you that each and every one of us, including myself, Father God, is just going to walk away from this evening so encouraged to renew our mind, Father. Why? So that we can experience that transformation that you have in our, for our marriage, for our business, for our life and children. God, I thank you, Father, that you bless each and every person that is here today, Father. I thank you that the rest of their week will be the best of their week. In Jesus' name, everybody that believed it said, amen, amen. Have a blessed rest of the night.